way, good morning. Uh, last week, if you weren't here, we started our new series dealing with a man named Gideon. And the reason we're looking at his life is this. God takes him through an incredibly transformative experience in his life where he goes from this guy that's just living in fear like everybody else in his society and like all the other Jews around him to becoming this man who starts embracing and actually fulfilling his God-given purpose in his life. And it's an incredible process that he goes through. It's actually a pretty lengthy one he goes through as well. But as we look at his life, there's a lot of things we can learn about our journey, about how we can go from being Christians living in the fear to Christians who are actually embracing um, and uh, filling or fulfilling our God-given obligation, our God-given desires on our life. So we're going to be looking at that. Uh, to start today, let me kind of give you a review of what happened in Gideon's life leading into today. Uh, last week, I introduced you to a book of Judges, which is in the Old Testament. And real quick little idea of the book of Judges is the book of Judges is the Jewish people obeying God and having success then disobeying God and worshiping other gods, and then God would send in uh, opposing armies that would come in and occupy them, and things would go terrible. And then they would break down when things got terrible, and they would basically call out to God and go, God, rescue us. Things are horrible. You rescue us. And God raises up these people called judges that he then would inspire, and he would gift them with the Spirit of God, and they would come in, and they would rescue Israel, and they would lead them back to the heights of their nation again and lead them back to good times. Then they would fail again, and they would go through the process, and it's just this process in a circle over and over and over again. Gideon is a man who enters in on one of their downturns, okay? Gideon enters the scene. At this time, Israel's been occupied for about seven years by a group of people called the Midianites. And the way their occupation worked was they weren't there all the time, but whenever the harvest time was, they would come in, and they would steal all the food, they would steal all the grain, all their animals, and they would steal everything and walk off with it. And Gideon enters into scene when we see him. Um, they're in a downtime at this time. Gideon is there with his people, and the Midianites are about to invade their land again, and the people are hiding. And we find Gideon in a hole, and he's what's called threshing wheat. He's taking a farming term. He's threshing wheat, but he's doing it in the ground, so he's hidden, so the Midianites cannot see him. And while he's there, an angel of the Lord shows up to him and refers to Gideon, this guy hiding in a hole, refers to him as mighty hero, and says, the Lord is with you. So this angel shows up to this guy in a hole, and he goes, you can see Gideon down there, and he's like, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And at that point, Gideon, for the first time, hears who he actually is, how God views him, and what you see is it's very hard for Gideon to accept it. Gideon is a guy living in a hole, and an angel comes and refers to him as mighty hero, and you see a guy just has a hard time going, I don't, that's real. And you know what this is like. Um, you know what it's like to hear hard truths in your life that are hard for you to accept, that you kind of have to go through a process before you can fully grasp it and accept it. This is just a truth of life. We know what these are like. Uh, for example, here's some hard truths of life that you're going to have to figure out if you haven't yet in life. Uh, the first one would be this. 95% of your problems are your fault. Okay? That, that's a hard truth of life. Um, those of us that are older and you've started to learn this, how many of you would agree with that? 95% of your, see all the hands up? 95% of the problems you have in life are your fault. Jennifer, yours is 100%, just so you know. Um, yeah, I don't know. You can blame, that's true, you can blame me. That's what we usually do is we like to blame people. Uh, but 95% of your problems in life are your fault. That's a hard truth to accept because as we're young, we always want to think it's everybody else's fault. The way things are going are going that way because it's someone else's fault. And as we get older, we start to figure out, no, it's actually probably my fault. I've made bad decisions. I didn't handle things I should have handled, and now they're coming back to bite me. That's a hard truth to understand. Uh, another one is this, uh, that no one owes you anything. This is another hard one as we leave our young years, as we grow up, is that the world owes you nothing. Um, I think we come out of high school and we come out of college thinking, I got my education, someone owes me a job. That I deserve a job. They just owe it to me. And you start to find out, no, no one owes you anything. You have to work. You have to go out there and you have to get it. No one's just going to hand you stuff most of the time. They owe you nothing. Um, you are no more special to them than anybody else. And it's about you working hard to achieve those things that you need to achieve. Another hard truth is this. Chicken nuggets might not be made of chicken, but they're still delicious. Okay, and this is a hard truth to comprehend. 
is you look at chicken nuggets and you go, man, those things are scrumptious. And then you see the commercials and you see like the little videos where it's like pink stuff that they say is what they are. Or you see like different chicken parts in the nuggets and you're like, I'll never eat them again. But then you go to McDonald's and you see. And you don't care what they're made of. They're just chicken nuggets. They're delicious. And that's a hard truth you have to accept that you go, I'm okay with that. I don't care if it's pink slime. It still tastes delicious with barbecue sauce. Hard truth you come to learn to accept. Uh, another one, problems don't just magically disappear. Okay, a hard truth in life. We want to think if we ignore our problems, they will just bad. And as you get older and as you go through life, you start to accept the fact no problems magic. Problems disappear when you handle issues. Problems disappear when you take the proper, uh, proper steps that you need to take to eliminate those problems. The other one is this. Dreams don't come true just by thinking about them. Another harsh truth of life, which is a lot of people think if I just think long enough and hard enough and I have dreams of what my dreams are going to be, they'll just come true. And you start to realize just thinking about your dreams doesn't make them true. What makes them true is taking the steps to start achieving them, making them happen. You have to do something about them. It doesn't just magically fall into your lap. Last week, though, Gideon ended up hearing a truth that he wasn't really uh, ready to understand or ready to accept. And what you see is that he struggles through this process, and that's what I want to look at today, is I want to look at what Gideon does when he first hears Mighty Hero. And what is his reaction? And his reaction is this, like I think many of our reactions would be. It is this, he rejects it, or he thinks God made a mistake. So when you're speaking to the wrong guy or whatever else, but... I'm not the guy you were supposed to call a mighty hero. I'm not the guy that's supposed to be doing this work for God. That is his reaction. That's what I want to look at this morning. So in Judges chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 13. And here's what he says. So the last statement is, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And here's Gideon's response. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has this happened to us? The first thing that happens is Gideon's response is, if God is with me and I'm a mighty hero, then why am I in a hole right now? Why is our nation on the verge of starvation? Why is all this bad stuff happening in our lives if God is really with us? And God, do you even have a clue who you're talking to and the people that I'm a part of is we're the Jews and I'm living in a hole right now because I'm scared out of my mind and I live in fear every day of my life for the fear of my life and you're calling me a mighty hero. You don't have a clue what's going on because I don't think God's here because look at all the stuff happening to me. And this is Gideon's first reason for rejection is what I like to call it. His first reason of why what God says about me isn't true. And his is this, I doubt that God is here with me. And I think a lot of us still struggle with that. Is last weekend when I tell you who God says you are, the first thing you start thinking about is, well, I just don't think God's here with me. I just feel like I'm on my own. I, I don't see God here on a daily basis. I don't feel him right now. I don't think God's with me. If he was here, why is all this other stuff happening? I just don't think God's here. And this is a common reason we reject what God says about us, is we go, God's there, and I'm here. And God's not here with me. He's up there watching it. And we reject God's call in our life. This is not uncommon. In Romans chapter 8, we read this from the Apostle Paul. He says, and I read this last week at uh, communion meditation as well. It says, does it mean that he, meaning God, does it mean that God no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Even in the New Testament, Paul's getting people going, Paul, all this stuff's happening in my life and none of it's good. Does that mean God's just left me? Does that mean God's not here with me anymore? And Paul's answer is very simple. No, it does not mean that. It does not mean that God has left, that God's not here anymore. God is. God is still here with you. And so Paul kind of shoots down that type of thinking. Next thing Gideon does is that's not enough for Gideon. Gideon goes on, he says this in verse 13, the second half. He says, and where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites? So the next thing of his reasoning is this. He starts looking at it and he goes, if God's still here, why don't I see miracles? 
why don't I see miracles anymore? I hear about all these miracles back in the ancient uh, times with Moses and everything. I haven't seen a miracle in my life. I'm living in a stinking hole, dude. Where's my miracles? If God is with us, why doesn't he show up and do something miraculous right now? Where is he? And we do this one as well, do we not? I, I want to see God do something supernatural before I take a step of faith and act in the ways that God wants me to act in. And we use the exact same reason for rejection that you see Gideon doing, which is this. I doubt that God still is in the business of the supernatural. And we go, I just don't think God does supernatural things anymore. So it's just left up to me. And if it's left up to me, I can't do what God just asked me to do. And Gideon's going, if it's just left up to me, you can't call me mighty hero because I'm sitting in a hole. And he's going, I don't think God still does supernatural. He used to do it back in the past. He doesn't do it anymore. I've had this question a lot of times as a minister. No, why doesn't God still do the miracle? Why don't I see the miracles that you see in the Bible? Is he still around? Is he still there? Is he still active that way? Um, People still go, before I act, God, show me something. You show me something supernatural so I don't have to doubt it. So I have no risk of failure. And that's really what we're asking. I don't want to have the chance that I might fail. Show me something supernatural so I know you're here, and then I will take a step of faith. And that's what Gideon does. Next, chat, or next verse, verse 14 and 15, we see his next excuse. The angel says, Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. And he says, I am sending you. And Gideon says, But Lord, Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Mansia, uh, and I am the least of my entire family. So Gideon goes telling me to go rescue these people. How am I supposed to do that? My tribe's the least of all the tribes, and I'm the least in my family. There's not a shot in the world I'm going to save you. Uh, here's one of the things he does. If you know later in the story, Gideon's lying here. Um, Gideon's exaggerating. Here. Gideon is not. The way he makes it sound when you read that is what? He's the least of all the people in Israel, right? He's from the weakest tribe, and he's from the weakest family, and he's the weakest in his family. So he's going, I'm, I'm the lowest dude in the entire society. We find out later he has 10 servants. Okay, that go with him on his first little test of faith. He has 10 servants. Gideon might not be anything spectacular. No one might know who his name is, but he's not the lowest peon of all the peons. But his thinking is, yeah, that's who I am. I, I can't do what God wants me to do. And his reason for rejection this time is this. It is the most common reason we reject God's call in our life is this. I know I can't do it. When you look at the Bible characters of the Bible, this is the most common response when God comes and says, this is what I need you to do, is almost all of them come up with excuses of why I can't do, God, what you just asked me to do, because I know what I'm capable of, and what you just asked me to be capable of, I can't be. I know my strengths, I know my weaknesses, I know my limits, I can't be that guy. Maybe Gideon was thinking, I don't have enough money to go raise up an army and pay them, so I'm the least of the tribes, I'm the least of the family, whatever. I don't have that type of capital to go raise an army, angel. Um, so when God's called me mighty hero and go save these people, it not happen. God says to us a lot of times, you're the light of the world. You're here to take my word to the world. You're supposed to be my, uh, you're my ambassador to the world. You see and we sit there a lot of times and go, I'm not capable. I'm not capable. That's, that's the reason I have to reject that God. So I'm just going to live my life in fear like everybody else, and I'm just going to sit over here, and I'm never going to make any waves. I'm not really going to live out the desires you have for my life because I'm not capable of that. But then in verse 16, this is what it says. It says, The Lord said to him, I will be with you. If you don't remember anything. Remember this. I, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. God says, I will be with you, and you will defeat these guys, and it's not even going to be a problem. I feel like you were just being up one guy. So it's not going to be a problem, Gideon. And, and what you see here is God, re, uh, re, God reveals Gideon why all of his reasons for rejection are just stupid. And that's really what he's doing. Is he's going, Gideon, all the reasons you told me why you can't do what I've called you to do, because they're stupid reasons. And the reason they're stupid is this. You left God out of the picture. You left God out of the equation. You talk about you, 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 you. But you never talk about me, 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 and what I can do. 
and he reveals to Gideon why all of his reasons for rejecting are just stupid reasons. You see, Gideon was always thinking how he was supposed to be this mighty hero, how he was supposed to rescue Israel. Do not, we do the same thing all the time. We hear God say these things about us, and then we look at ourselves, and we go, it's my response why I'm supposed to do all this stuff. I'm scared. I can't do it. Because we look at ourselves. See, it was never about Gideon. It was always about what God was going to do. Gideon. Gideon was just going to be a tool in God's hands, and God's power was going to be one that accomplished work. It was never about Gideon. And to be honest with you, it's never about It all comes down to you allowing God to use you as a tool to accomplish his work by his power. Does that make sense? Um, the Apostle Paul, he struggled with this one. Um, in Philippians chapter 4, we see that Paul actually figured it out at one point because he says this. He says in Philippians 4, he says, For I can do everything who? Does he say I can do everything through Paul? No. He understood if it was through Paul, there's no chance he's ever going to achieve the thing God's achieved. He says, I can do everything through Christ. It gives me. Paul had started to figure it out it wasn't about me. It's about what God was going to do. God said, this is who I am. This is who I'm going to be. Not because I'm capable, but because I know Christ can do everything by the power of God. He started to figure that out. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we also see Paul struggle with this concept. Um, Paul, in this passage, a little background, he's struggling with some things going on in his life. We don't know specifically what they are, but he's struggling with some things that he feels are limitations for him becoming the person God wants him to be. So he's looking at his life and he's going, I know God has told me I'm supposed to basically take the message of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles and build the Gentile church. And he's looking going, but I have these issues in my life and I have these limitations. And he says, he goes to God and he just starts begging God, God, would you take these from me? Would you get rid of these? I don't know if they're sins or what's happening in his life, but something he felt were stopping things that would stop him from becoming who God wanted him to be. And he begs God and begs God. And then it says this, it says, this is God responding to him. My power works best and weakness. So now, this is Paul speaking, so now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in insult, hardship, and persecutions, and trouble that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, I am The reason Paul knew when he was weak, that meant he was really strong, is when he Week, it's when he finally took his hands off things and went, God, it's dependent on you. Take your hands off things and go, God, it's dependent on you. God can do miraculous things through you. God can do natural things. God can change lives. When you get your hands off uh, the steering wheel and go, God, you take it over. And that's where Paul was here. And then Paul starts accepting, what? When I accept my, accept my weaknesses and stop trying to keep it in God's hand, that's when I'm actually See, what allowed Gideon to finally start accepting who God said he was is when he finally started to figure out that his usefulness for the kingdom of God wasn't determined by his abilities, but rather God's power. And that's when things will start to change. That's when you will start to accept the same things that God says about you is when you start to realize your usefulness for the kingdom of God has nothing to do with you. It's totally dependent on the power of God. He's the one that called you. He's the one that will empower you to be not you based on your skill set. 